This is a continuation of Lectures in Christian Doctrine by Dr. Joe Sprinkle. The current lecture is on spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 4-7 speaks of spiritual gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Spiritual gifts have been given by God to edify and uplift the church. And this lecture will focus on the Bible's teaching about spiritual gifts. There are a number of listings of spiritual gifts in various parts of the New Testament. Uh, Romans 12 has a list, encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, teaching. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, administration, discernment, healing, interpretation of tongues, tongues, uh, prophecy, wisdom, apostle, faith, helps, knowledge, miracles, and teaching. Ephesians 4 talks about uh, pastor, uh, apostle, pastor, teaching, evangelism, and prophecy. And 1 Peter 4, serving and teaching. A little bit of terminology. There is the Greek word charismata, which is related to charis grace, and it uh, means a gift or a spiritual gift, but it's uh, uh, related to grace, so you might say it's a gift of grace. And then uh, pneumatica uh, is related to pneuma spirit, and it uh, explicitly means a manifestation of a of the spirit a spiritual gift and both these words are almost exclusively Pauline in origin <clears throat> well anyway various passages talk about spiritual gifts and here's another list Romans 12 1st Corinthians 12 1st Corinthians 12 again, 1 Corinthians 12 again, uh, and then Ephesians uh, 4, 11, uh, analyzed slightly differently than the previous chart that we had. And what I'd like to do is to go through uh, these gifts. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to, I'm going to do it systematically rather than in the order that they occur in Scripture. There are certain gifts that are gifts of revelation. That would include the word of knowledge or wisdom, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Exactly what the difference is between an utterance of knowledge and an utterance of wisdom is not clear. A message of wisdom might be more practical, telling of believers how to live their lives. A message of knowledge may have been more doctrinal. Uh, we really don't know. It doesn't explain it. An utterance of wisdom might be more evangelistic. An utterance of knowledge more teaching. But in any case, uh, utterance of knowledge is an utterance that brings uh, uh, first brings that insight into God's purposes. And uh, probably those who were endowed with these gifts, quote, enjoyed a special experience of the Spirit by which a message came to them that they transmitted to the congregation. That was a quote from D.A. Carson. And then there's prophecy. Prophecy speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort, according to 1 Corinthians 14.3. A prophet differs from a preacher in that he spoke a message immediately from God. Prophecy was the mark of the outpouring of the Spirit in the last days, according to Joel 2.28 and Acts 2.16-18. The widespread experience of prophecy among the earliest Christians was therefore proof that the climax to God's salvation history was already in train. Now, unlike tongues or glossolalia, uh, prophecy spoke to the mind as well as the spirit. 
Consequently, it built up the church more than any other gift. Now, prophecy in church services is described in 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 33. Uh, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirit of prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. A third gift is the discernment of spirits. This gift serves as a check on false prophecy. Prophets had to be tested as to whether or not they were genuine, as uh, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14.29. See, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. That's a process of testing of the prophets. Paul commanded us to test the charisma and to hold only to that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22. D.A. Carson comments on this gift of discernment. There is ever a need to distinguish demonic forces from the Holy Spirit. This gift is apparently designed to meet that need. The outworking of this gift may on occasion be the byproduct of profound doctrinal discernment. The fourth gift is glossolalia and the interpretation of tongues. Tongues and the interpretation of tongues balance each other. Some take the fact that tongues need interpretation to mean that tongues were ecstatic utterances that were unintelligible apart from interpretation. Tongues in uh, Acts 2, however, appear to be a miraculous gift of intelligible language not ecstatic speech, at least in that passage. Paul values glossolalia and used it in his own private worship, according to 1 Corinthians 14.28, though he considered prophecy to be the greater gift. Again, tongues were used in church services, 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet uh, in the church and speak to himself and to God. So tongues were allowed, but only in the case of uh, where there was an interpreter that could give the meaning of what was going on. Well, that's the first set, uh, Gifts of Revelation. Uh, let me move on to Gifts of Healing and Power. And that'll include faith, healing, and miracles. Number one, uh, faith. Paul means by faith, experiences of faith, particularly surges of confidence to trust God in a particular situation or for a particular event. Faith to, uh, to remove mountains, as it were, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2. Second gift is healings, and such healings were a feature of Jesus' ministry and that of the early church. And then there's miracles. Paul gives first-hand testimony of the miracles in his own ministry, as described in Romans 15 and 2 Corinthians 12 and Galatians 3, as well as uh, Hebrews 2. Uh, Paul uh, may have in mind exorcisms or the wider range of miracles recorded in the Gospels and Acts, including nature, nature miracles and miracles of judgment. Again, various passages in Mark and Acts. Then the next category is gifts of leadership. There's apostleship, there's teaching, there's administration, there's exhortation, there's evangelism. Apostles are first mentioned in some of the lists in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and Ephesians 4, 11. 
Apostleship was bestowed by the living Christ through the Holy Spirit, so that the apostles became the foundation of the church, in a sense secondary only to that of Christ himself. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. They conveyed the gospel to the church. Now, originally an apostle had to be an eyewitness of Jesus and the resurrection, as described in Acts 1, 22 and 23, when Judas had committed suicide, they chose someone who had been an eyewitness of the things that they had seen. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 uh, says that he is an apostle. He has indeed seen the Lord in the resurrection. But since they had to be an eyewitness of Jesus and the resurrection, there can be no apostles today. Second, it's teaching. Now, how does uh, teaching differ from prophecy? The prophet gave a message directly prompted by God. The teacher passes on and explains and applies to a given, a given circumstance what he receives from apostles and the writings of prophets. Timothy was a teacher rather than a prophet. When he's told, and the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. Church leaders, overseers need to be able to teach according to the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3 2. And Ephesians 4 11 adds the idea of pastor uh, to that of teacher. Uh, when he talks about pastors and teachers, it should probably be hyphenated pastor teachers. Pastors communicate or teach with the care of a shepherd, and hence pastor and teacher go together. And then there's the gift of governments or administration or guidance, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, similarly uh, Romans uh, 12 and verse 8. The early church's organization was still fluid. It was necessary, therefore, that certain members should receive and exercise the gift of ruling or governing the local assembly of believers. And this gift would take the form of sound advice and wise judgment in directing church affairs. And then fourth, there's the gift of exhortation mentioned in uh, Romans 12 and verse 8. The gift of exhortation closely uh, is closely allied with that of the Christian prophet and teacher. The difference is it's more personal in approach uh, as that of an exhorter. Uh, Barnabas had that gift. He is uh, labeled the son of encouragement in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. And then there's the gift of evangelism. Certain people are called evangelists, Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5, and Philip in Acts 21 and verse 8. Uh, the task of evangelism is preaching the gospel. Although it's everyone's responsibility uh, to uh, convey the gospel to the people that we know, uh, certain people are entrusted especially uh, with this task. Converts from an evangelist ministry then can be funneled into the church for building up by the other people's gifts. And then there's gifts of service. One of the gifts of service is the gift of helping. And this uh, we might relate to Acts 20 and verse 35, uh, talking about helping the weak. Uh, and remember the Lord's words, it's more blessed to give than to receive. The early church had a special concern for the needy, those uh, uh, who helped uh, the indigent were considered to have been endowed by the Spirit for this ministry. And indeed, the office of deacon is built on this service of helping, as we described in Acts uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, where uh, Basically, they, they served uh, tables, but uh, the word serve and the word deacon are related to each other and are probably uh, intertwined. Uh, related to that is a, a gift of service, the alkania, Romans 12 and verse 7. It's difficult to know exactly what Paul means by it here, but again, it's related to the word deacon or diakonos, and this probably refers to practical service or similar 
uh, and is similar to helping.